Today's video is the beginning of a new series where I bring attention to players who get less recognition than they deserve. It can be superstar players or quality role players, as long as it's a player who general audiences could learn about. Hopefully, with this series, you'll gain a greater understanding and appreciation of many players from basketball history. I'm starting off by going in alphabetical order of the players' last names. So let me know in the comments what are some players who you would like to see in this series. Also, assuming this series does well, I would be happy to go through the alphabet several times, seeing how there's so many players to learn about. So if you'd like to see more, please make sure to like and comment to help the video. So without further ado, let's get into it. Maurice Cheeks Mo Cheeks was one of those all-star point guards who did a little bit of everything. He was the Philadelphia 76ers floor general in the 1980s, and he was a key star for their dominating championship run in 1983. Cheeks didn't do a tremendous amount of scoring as he averaged 11.1 points over his career, but what he chipped in, he did extremely efficiently for a point guard, as he shot a career 52.3%. He was a quality facilitator, getting as high as 9.2 assists per game in 1986, but his greatest strength was his pickpocket skills. For the first 10 seasons of his career, Cheeks finished in the top 10 in steals per game, and currently, he's 6th on the NBA's all-time list in total steals. Thanks to his tenacious tendencies, he made a total of 5 all-defense teams throughout his career. Let me be clear, he was never on the level of Magic Johnson and Isaiah Thomas's greatness, but it wouldn't be a stretch to say that Mo Cheeks was an elite point guard in his day. Michael Cooper Cooper was one of the more underrated pieces of the Lakers Showtime era of the 1980s. He was actually one of the first 3 and D players in NBA history, as he was a consistent beneficiary of Magic Johnson's elite court vision. Not only was he a consistent threat from downtown, but for a while, he actually held the NBA Finals record for the most three-pointers made in a Finals game. He was also sneaky athletic, as he was often Magic's go-to teammate for the alley-oop pass, which was quickly coined as the Koopa Loop. By far, his greatest skill, though, was his all-time great defense. Cooper made a remarkable eight all-defense teams, which is the second most in Lakers franchise history, trailing only Kobe Bryant. But unlike Kobe, Cooper actually won the Defensive Player of the Year award, which he did while coming off the bench in 1987. Dave Cowens There are many legendary faces in the history of the Boston Celtics, and the most famous of them all was the championship-winning center, Bill Russell. With that being said, he wasn't the only legendary winning center that they've had, as the great Dave Cowens did some dominating of his own in the 1970s. Cowens was a physically punishing force under the rim, averaging as high as 20 points per game and 16 rebounds per game. He made three all-defense teams, was the league MVP in 1973, and he won two championships as arguably the best player on his team. On many other organizations, he'd be known as the most famous player in franchise history. But as a member of the Boston Celtics, he remains as one of the most underrecognized to this very day. Louis Dampier In the history of basketball, you could argue that no player has ever been more ahead of his time than Louis Dampier. This six-foot point guard did play his final three seasons in the NBA after the merger in 1976, but he made a name for himself before that in the ABA. Louis finished his ABA career as the league's all-time leading scorer with well over 13,000 points, and he averaged as high as 26 points per game in 1970. He was a great scorer and shooter in many aspects, but the part that really made him ahead of his time was his three-point shooting. Decades ago, most three-point shooters were simply spot-up or catch-and-shoot players, but Louis was different. He would shoot three-pointers in a variety of ways, including in transition, which was completely unheard of at the time. Louis never saw a decent look that he didn't like, as he had a green light like no one else from his era. In 1969, he was shooting a whopping 7.1 three-point attempts per game. For perspective, entire ABA and NBA teams were not averaging 7.1 three-point attempts per game until 22 years later in the 1991 season. 
This legend was pulling the trigger from deep with the frequency of a modern superstar, but he was doing it in the 1960s. Truly a player who doesn't get enough recognition. Adrian Dantley. In my opinion, he's one of the most underrecognized and underappreciated scorers of all time. If you were not winning championships in the 1980s, then it was hard to get noticed in a talent-packed era, with teams like the Celtics, Lakers, Pistons, and 76ers drawing all of the attention. In his prime years, Dantley was the leading superstar of the Utah Jazz. His absolute bread and butter was his nearly automatic mid-range jumper. He was a very fundamentally sound and methodical player, and this resulted in some truly stunning numbers. Over a four-season stretch from 1981 to 1984, Dantley averaged 30.5 points, 6.1 rebounds, and 4 assists on an absurdly accurate 56.4% shooting. Consistently averaging north of 30 while hitting over 55% of his shots is a truly impressive feat for a dominant center, but for a 6'5 small forward, that's basically unheard of. The unfortunate reality is that Dantley's legacy is that he was one of the most unlucky players of all time, as he was traded away from the Lakers right before they won the championship in 1980, and he was traded away from the Pistons right before they won the championship in 1989. Regardless of his ringless legacy, don't lose track of the fact that Dantley was certainly one of the most talented players throughout the 1980s. Baron Davis this 6'3 point guard spent his best days with the Hornets and Warriors, as he was the leader of the famous We Believe Warriors in 2007 that went on to upset the first seeded Dallas Mavericks in the first round. Davis was an explosive guard who was definitely a quality facilitator, but to me, he always came across as a score first player. Despite being a relatively shorter player, Davis was a thunderous finisher around the rim, punishing many bigs who would dare to challenge him. Along with his remarkable athleticism, he was also great at causing turnovers, as he led the NBA in steals twice, with a career average of 1.8 per game. He wasn't without some weaknesses though, and although he got as high as 23 points per game in 2004, he was a bit of an inefficient volume scorer, as he was only a 40.9% shooter from the field. He was also plagued with injuries throughout his playing days, which caused him to miss far more games than your average star player. With that being said, Davis was a two-time All-Star and a dangerous player who was capable of taking over games in the fourth quarter. Daryl Dawkins Although his name is Daryl, he's more frequently referred to as Chocolate Thunder. It was a very fitting nickname as this 6'11 center was notorious for his thunderous slams. On a few occasions, his slams were so powerful that they actually delayed the game entirely as he shattered the backboard twice in a span of three weeks. Now he was never considered as a superstar, but in his best years in Philadelphia, he was certainly a key contributor getting close to averaging a double-double in nearly 30 minutes per game, and he was regularly among the league leaders in field goal percentage as he hit a stellar 57.2% of his shots throughout his playing days. It wasn't all positive though, as Dawkins had a nasty habit of getting in foul trouble, as he averaged 3.8 personal fouls over the course of his career, which is tied for the sixth highest average in NBA history. Sloppiness in general was an issue, as he also turned the ball over more than you'd like to see from the center position. His career should have lasted longer than it did, but because of a series of back injuries, he only played in a total of 26 regular season games in his final three seasons, and by the age of 32, he had played his final game in the NBA. Joe Dumars This 6'3 shooting guard is one of the more underrated two-way players in basketball, the bad boy Detroit Pistons of the 1980s were led by Isaiah Thomas, but at the time, there was no question that their second best player was Joe Dumars. He had a smooth and reliable pull-up jumper, and he averaged as high as 23.5 points in 1993. Other than Dennis Rodman, he was the Pistons' best defensive player, as he made five all-defense teams in Detroit and was the man assigned to guard the dynamic Michael Jordan. Dumars was also known to be a clutch performer, 
and in the 1989 NBA Finals, he averaged 27.3 points and 6 assists on 57.6% shooting, as he picked the Showtime Lakers defense apart. Thanks to this epic performance, he was rewarded with the Finals MVP. Too often, people talk about the bad boy Detroit Pistons without bringing up Joe Dumars. But that would be like talking about the Bulls dynasty without mentioning Scottie Pippen. You just can't do that while giving the team its proper respect. TR Dunn This 6'4 shooting guard spent the majority of his years as a member of the contending Denver Nuggets in the 1980s. That Nuggets team was known primarily as an elite high scoring offense and for their complete disregard of the defensive end of the court. That team was the embodiment of the term, the best defense is double the offense. The one exception on that roster was their elite wing defender, Theodore Roosevelt Dunn. Dunn was always the player assigned to guard the elite scorers like Michael Jordan and Clyde Drexler, and he usually did an excellent job of such. Regardless of the fact that Denver was arguably the worst offensive team overall, Dunn stood out individually as he made three straight all-defense teams from 1983 to 1985. He was never a great offensive player, and you certainly wouldn't describe him as a star, but he's definitely one of the more forgotten elite defenders of the 1980s. Mark Eaton this towering monstrosity wasn't just a solid rim protector, but he was one of the most intimidating shot blockers that the game has ever seen. You could even make the argument that he was the best shot blocker since Wilt Chamberlain. Don't believe me? Well, let me tell you a little bit more about him. Mark was a 7 foot 4 inch center who spent his entire career on the Utah Jazz. In total, he made five all defense teams and won the Defensive Player of the Year in 1985 and in 1989 making him one out of only seven centers who have won the award multiple times. Over the course of his career, he averaged an insane 3.5 blocks per game, which is the highest career average of all time. But what's even more impressive than that was his peak. He also has the highest single season blocks per game average in NBA history, at a jaw-dropping 5.6 per game, which he did in 1985. For perspective, that was more than doubled what Akeem Olajuwon averaged that season, who happens to be the all-time leader in blocked shots. Mark led the NBA in blocks four times, which is tied with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar for the most of all time. He was definitely a specialist on the court, since his rebounding was only decent and he certainly wasn't a great scorer. But as far as great rim protection goes, it doesn't get much better than Mark Eaton. Sean Elliott there have been many great players in Spurs history who have contributed to championships, like Duncan, Robinson, Parker, Leonard, and Ginobili. But one of them that almost never gets mentioned, but should, is the 6'8 small forward, Sean Elliott. Throughout the 90s in San Antonio, this man was known as the Ninja, and he was always a scoring threat that had to be respected. On one hand, he was an athletic and explosive slasher who had handles and the hops to finish at the rim with style. On the other hand, he was an elite three-point shooter that you should never give too much space on the perimeter. At his peak, he was averaging 20 points and five rebounds per game in 1996, and he was known to make many clutch shots for the Spurs in the postseason but none were more iconic than the Memorial Day Miracle in Game 2 of the 1999 Western Conference Finals. Down two with the game on the line, Elliott kept his toes in bound as he hit the game-winning three-point shot, which many Spurs fans see as the symbolic image for the beginning of their dynasty. Dale Ellis Throughout his career, this 6'7 wing was a bit of a journeyman, playing for many franchises in his 17 seasons. But with that being said, he was an absolute bucket in his prime years in Seattle, averaging as high as 27.5 points in 1989. Generally, he was a great scorer, but his greatest gift was certainly his three-point shooting, as he was regularly among the league leaders in three-point attempts and in three-point efficiency. He won the NBA's three-point contest in 1989 and was usually Larry Bird's greatest threat in those competitions. Unfortunately, the inflation in three-point attempts over the last decade has resulted in players like Ellis becoming overlooked as time has gone on. But make no mistake, he was one of the greatest three-point shooters to ever live. 
Lafonso Ellis. This 6'8 power forward was an electrifying player, who consistently provided energy and intensity. Two things you could always expect from him was hustle and attitude, which made him a perfect fit for a youthful Denver Nuggets team in the mid-1990s. On offense and defense, he was a high flyer, who provided plenty of mesmerizing highlights with his vicious slams and with his punishing blocks, which includes arguably the greatest block in NBA history, when he straight up ripped the ball from Brian Davis. At his best, he was averaging 22 points and 7 rebounds in 1997. He was definitely a quality player, yet he never made a single all-star team. But with that being said, the guy was a walking highlight every time he set foot on the court. So what do you guys think? What are some players that you'd like to see in this series? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Thanks for watching as always, make sure to like and subscribe for more basketball content, and I'll see you guys in the next video.